Hello ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be doing a rundown of week 4, day 2 of the LEC. We had G2 vs Mad Lions and of course Team Heretics vs BDS. Team Heretics vs BDS, eventful game. You know, we will also do, of course, the predictions later in this video. So if that's what you're interested in, it should be in the timestamps below. Ladies and gentlemen, interesting games today. Let's start off with Team Heretics. Team Heretics... Um, and BDS, you know, I predicted BDS because I I don't think that uh, Team Heretics are dynamic enough in in early lane phase to to create advantages significant enough to uh, to break um, BDS's uh, process of setting up for objectives. I think that's usually where BDS struggle the most, where where Shio has no rhythm in the game and the early game doesn't uh, pan out as BDS kind of imagine and. Um, uh, they showcase today that uh, uh, with, with over time, uh, Team Retics is going to make some kind of a blunder or, or give up a little bit too much and find themselves in positions where uh, they don't win. And uh, Team Retics is a team that isn't super, super keen on, on pulling the trigger when, when they need to. And uh, with some poor usage of, of, of ultimates and, 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 and playing poorly in, in standoffs. Um, if, if Team Retics is not playing against a team that is making an abundant amount of mistakes, uh, they don't seem to be... Uh, uh, the same level of, um, you know, the same level of sharpness, you know. Um, I say this because uh, LEC, the split, you know, was very messy in terms of gameplay. And I think Team Meretics had a very high, uh, you know, floor relative relative to their ceiling. But I feel like that their ceiling is something that uh, uh, some of the other team, most teams in the playoffs uh, can uh, for sure surpass. Uh, but Team Meretics, uh, you know, they managed to piece together... Uh, a method of playing that makes sense you know they have an identity uh but uh, i think that in terms of who their carries are in, in 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 certain games i feel like these are the players that need to branch out more and and uh, you know have more impact in terms of the lane phase and also in terms of how you know much presence they actually have in team fight situations and nevertheless, Team Retics versus BDS i was very surprised to see this alzir ban senna ban still sticks which in my mind uh, makes sense against uh, someone like Flacket, likes to play those dirty combinations. Uh, Team Heretics banned Olaf and removed Rel and Ash. Ash is, of course, something that uh, Ice has been playing in the past and he has drawn some bans even in this split. But uh, BDS, you know, seem very keen on putting Ice on carries. And I think that Ice, honestly, together with Karzi, Ice and Karzi have been the two best performing ADs in my mind. I think that they've done a super good job. Uh, like uh, Flacket has been fairly consistent, but uh, I think that in terms of putting on carry performances, uh, Kazi and Ice uh, are definitely the best two performing ADs of, of, of Europe, and I think that I showcase that in this series too. Uh, Karma is something that I mentioned in my rundown uh, that uh, I thought that uh, with the nerf that this was headshot, but we've seen Karma enough now on 14.6 to know that this champion is still relevant. Karma to be picked into Oriana, Oriana. Uh, you know, doesn't like dealing with Karma's range, and Karma still seems to be scaling quite fine. The nerfs were very well deserved, but it also seems that the nerfs kind of landed and landed her in a position where it's quite fair. Uh, the enemy team follows up with Varus and then Volibear. Here, Jax is the answer that people do into Volibear. This is the go-to. Renata Glass gets banned, Renekton. Enemy team bans Darius and Rakan. They're banning Rakan just in case. I don't know, maybe they didn't want to blind. Um, you know, maybe they wanted to blind something else here. If the enemy didn't show Nautilus on 4, not sure about the Rakan ban. Uh, the enemy goes Nautilus. Maybe they just think about the pairing, but I think if enemy goes Rakan on 4, you get Nautilus, you're quite happy. Not so sure. Maybe it's like Lavrov specific. Uh, BDS banned Renekton. And uh, Team Retics uh, pick Kesante Alastar into the Nautilus. Kesante makes sense when Nautilus is showing. Um, with Darius out, Olaf out, you would think that maybe, oh, Adam's going to play Garen here. But Adam actually showed a very new side to himself. And this is speaking the Twisted Fate. This was my main point of criticism towards BDS. Why doesn't Adam play the ranged champions? He doesn't want to play the Jace, the TF, the Rumble. And finally, it they deliver. I think this is a very good look uh, that they are, you know, highlighting some of their weaknesses. And they're also or actually getting the most out of top lane. And I think that this is like a very positive step uh, in the direction of, you know, uh, BDS and the uh, development. I think that's cool that they added Karma and Twisted Fate. Took them quite some time because both of these champs have gotten nerfed in that time span. But 
uh, I think this was a, a solid idea and a solid identity. Uh, in regards to the game, I wanted to highlight some, some key moments. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> Fairly smooth sailing across the board. I think this was uh, the first key timer here. Adam pushes. And then on the Kisante base, where he TPs back and he pushes, uh, Adam actually chooses to open on the map. And the team with the, the Varos and, and of course, uh, the Volibear, they want to be winning situations like this, naturally. But the fact that uh, TF gets the base in, he bases and hovers and goes, uh, it's a very good look because he has tier 2 boots. This is such a good timer because he's not going to lose anything topside. Um, that you see here, we have Jax now coming in. And now we have TF calling. Because most of the time, uh, in my mind, you know, blue side should be quite winning in such a fight. Uh, but TF uh, looking to commit into this situation gives them, you know, uh, you know, the, the space to actually rock and roll. I think that the Ankos maybe could have positioned harder on the top side. And uh, I think that this turn here that Trimby does is very, very bad. Uh, this turn here doesn't make any sense, right? You want to play in the space and when the enemy crosses your sphere of influence here in the dick bush, then you can go. Especially when Drake is so low, you want to rather look for the finish and then exit together. I think the Trimby misplays here regardless of Adam's play. Because even though they have stronger champs here, they would have just lost it straight up uh, with, with, with how Trimby went. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I like this move from Adam. Uh, a little bit of an updated version of the Adam Classic. He gets a kill and on the Ghost, runs back top, doesn't lose anything. Really, really nice. Uh, we continue. You know, this game, uh, you could uh, clearly see that there was uh, some hints of of uh, carefulness in the way BDS played. It seemed like they were aware of the fact that eventually they'll get to the point where, you know, life is good. I do think Adam can get away from this. He tries to R out, but uh, he just gets cancelled. I think that uh, rotating flash and then you have ghost on is perfectly fine. Don't need to burn ult. I think, of course, he can live here. Uh, we continue. Uh, here, after Kesante gets a kill, he doesn't have shoes yet. Icebone Gauntlet is finished. He has the item. He does look for this Q3, but now with this uh, with this Q3 missing, there is no lethal because Wunder doesn't even have ult. Uh, I don't know why Wunder is posturing like this, this wave. Like this is just straight up anything here from Wunder. I think even in a world where he hits this Q3, this uh, Adam with double sums and boots advantage is not going to find any kill. Like Wunder doesn't have all out either. So I don't know what the fuck Wunder is looking for. This is just Wunder straight up uh, uh, running it down. Uh, so we continue. Uh, BDS uh, have uh, the Drake position and Kisante needs to TP to his homie. Oriana was getting outpushed in lane and BDS used the swing timer to of course take the Drake, uh, which is super important. Volibear is getting very little value in this game and uh, it's uh, of course a hard time. At this moment, Adam should just wait for the wave to crash, uh, for Wonder to kind of reveal himself. Uh, he will play with the information for that wave and then retake with Jax. Uh, this is just a decent trap that uh, uh, team Heret is kind of set up here. Uh, I, I kind of like this one, but I think that uh, Adam can outplay it. Uh, we continue. Six uh, grubblings here for Team Red Six, but their composition really can't leverage it. Like, both lane matchup is rough. After Zeri finishes static shift and it's accelerated, they have Alistar, which is not strong for the lane. Uh, and uh, additionally, you know, at matchup top, it's like it sounds not really hit uh, too much of the turret. Uh, we continue. Yeah, I think this is uh, quite a good move from BDS. I like that they are not hyper-focused on the objective. Uh, something to do, though, I don't think they should burn TF ult the way they did, because maybe you can look for a very big punish when the enemy top laner actually TP's top to defend. Uh, I like this commitment here from TF to just hit, because the enemy is not defending. They are bleeding so much. Uh, this is a very tanky Drake, because this is the third one. It's also a Chemtech, so the value the enemy gets from this is very limited. But I think that you should hold the TF ult. I think here Labrov can just ward uh, over the wall and he can see all. If you hold TF ult, the key thing is that happens is when enemy starts channeling TP here and your team is soft contesting, you just hover, you port, and then you cut the enemy off and maybe you even ace them here and kill them here. Not ace, but you can get a really good fight going. Uh, so I think this is a detail that can be done better. Don't need the TF ult just to, to spot them. I think Labrov can just ward over the wall and all is good and uh, uh, the, the soft contest would, uh, would pay off. Uh, much more. I will continue. Yeah, I don't like what BDS did. I, I think it's just this extension here where Labrov is contesting the wrong space. 
Uh, he is uh, walking in here while his uh, Zed is on the mid wave. It's just not necessary. I don't know what he's fighting for. Uh, maybe he's assuming the enemy based, but uh, Baros shouldn't be able to afford Ginzu just yet. And uh, uh, considering that they walk through enemy vision, uh, I think that it's a very easy decision for BDS to do to, to just uh, peace out. So Adam uses Flash. Uh, Labrov also has to peace out. You know, this is not that great. All right. We continue. Uh, game state here, if we compare it, I don't think blue side is in a bad spot. Uh, you need to be very careful about how you fight. Oriana and Varosult uh, should be able to give value. They should just CC one target, kill one target. If the fight goes on for long, uh, it becomes a little bit hard. Red side really wants to play this on Kama ult and, and, and TF card poke. Uh, Zeri should just be there to hit when Alistar and uh, Kesante and Volibear commit. It's very hard for Zeri to actually trade. Uh, also with Oriana and, and the Varos. So you're poking from far. And then Jax and Zeri will retaliate when the enemy tries to all in. You, BDS shouldn't look to be the ones uh, committing first. Uh, but we look at this one. Uh, some of the cues. Flacket is flying. Uh, you know, he's attack speed Varos, so they are not doing too much damage. Uh, Wunder is coming in from a flank. I think here, uh, uh, you know, in my mind, I think that uh, when they see this guy's position like this, I would love to see Adam to react and just walk up to him and begin to auto him, trade with him, so he actually feels disrupted. I think that Wunder gets too easy of an access here on, on the situation. I think that uh, here, I think uh, that Adam should just be walking on him, hitting him, like not letting him uh, cut into his team uh, so easily. Also here, Adam uh, uses card, which is not necessary. I think that he could just trade with Wunder, and then uh, Shiro needs to, of course, uh, flash and use uh, some abilities to get the fuck out, because he gets CC chained here, which is not necessary. I, I think that they could have gone away with more here. Here in this moment, I was thinking, while I was watching, if they should be actually pressing Nash here. Um, yeah, in my mind, you know, Varos, Oriana, uh, against a Karma that is quite low HP, maybe it's difficult with TF uh, port being able to show them. Uh, I was just thinking, I guess there's no realistic way for Blue Set to actually turn. It makes sense to not do Nash. Just looking at the fact that Jackson Nautilus is dead, just uh, wanted to check if there's more to be done there. And uh, we continue. Uh, BDS uh, just uh, pretty much play Nash position. Uh, one thing that I didn't like is that um, in, in this spot, I think that um, it looks to be like BDS is kind of overgrouping after they retake Top River. Blackard is uh, catching the wave. I think it's just uh, good to walk into bottom side after Nook uh, commit uh, onto this mid wave. I think if you manage to secure this wave and the enemy is not contesting it, it means that the enemy base, I think you can cross back into bot with Karma and, and have a good time. But this is not horrible either, you're just sweeping vision, so it's not that bad. You just have to be mindful of all about going into bot again. Oriana pushed a deep wave because you had full information. And now Oriana is pushing here again. It's just that if, if you commit and make this movement all the way when the enemy is showing on bot with Oriana and you have TP to match with Karma and you have TF on your team, I think that. Uh, like, unless you're actively trying to hit Nash in this spot because you have three items on Zeri, I don't think you should make uh, such a commitment all the way. You should just hover to make sure that the midwave is secured, and then based on how enemy reacts to that midwave, you can choose to, to play the game, right? So I think Nuke is just uh, over-posturing here because he's giving way too much information to Oriana for Oriana to be able to push so deep, and I don't think it's necessary to give away. Basically, the movement I want to see is that Nuke goes through mid, Hover's mid, sees if there's a fighter mid, if his team gets prior, they are can step into river, he has TP and the enemy enters in what Kama position is. And uh, of course, uh, Flacket and let's say Trimby are showing on the mid wave, and there's no danger for them to actually fish a river because they can read very easily what the Medicates wants to do in that spot. Now we continue. Here, very crucial moment, Adam. Gets flashed on by Yankos. No follow up there. Oriana is on the range to Saint Chain CC. I just want to show here the Varo suit flies. And then Adam comes back in. And then the Oriana ult goes wide. And all of a sudden, Team Heretics have no tools to actually fight. I think here in this moment, if BDS want to play a little bit more risk heavy style with a massive amount of game here. I say risk, maybe risk is, is, is the wrong word, but there is room to uh, to maybe make a mistake here in this spot. 
I um, I think that um, in this moment in time, if I look at BDS as champions, there's no threat on ice. They can clean like ace fighting here. Varos no ult, Oriana no ult. I think that uh, BDS, if they wanted to, could all in here and look for uh, the, the Drake. I don't think their play was bad because they do commit to the Nash and play position, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there's going to be moments in game where uh, going for more is the correct decision. Here they don't scale too bad and getting Nash is still super winning, but I think that they could just uh, straight up ace uh, the enemy there after they use Varus and Oriano the way they did. But okay. Uh, they get the finish and they're kiting back. And the uh, Timeretics are over chasing into this situation. As mentioned before, they don't have tools, so uh, they are looking for a fight that uh, isn't so favorable. And, uh, after Trimby combos here, there's no follow up, of course, because people are out of range. And there's no Rihanna ult, there's nothing, so they're just chasing into their uh, imminent death. Wunder tried to kidnap someone, but it wasn't good enough. And uh, BDS, of course, are winning the rest of the game. I think in the standoffs, I think that TF can contribute a lot more. I think if uh, if, if TF is with them with the rapid fire cannon, I think that um, you know one card on Alastar, one card on Bolivar, anything really followed by a Mantra Q, it's like they they they, they gain so much. I think in these standoffs, it's better if Adam is actually with the team, so you can throw cards and pressure the Alastar and Bolivar and kiss on the way, making space. Fresh meme. Uh, I wanted to highlight as well uh, the build here of Adam. With Send, I think Stormraiser honestly is overrated item. Happy to just okay, agree with me. Stormraiser are overrated. Uh, I think that, um, you know, going Kraken instead of Stormraiser really gives you a lot of damage. Uh, I think that the move speed is not so good, and I think Stormraiser, generally speaking, is just a very weak item. And uh, we continue. Let's take a look at the final fight. Nuke is playing in the dick bush, poking the enemy as they enter. Kankos gets uh, W'd and he gets CC'd. Labro finds one, holds, black it on the back end. Ice. Beautiful game from Ice. Just, just very well done. Okay. Uh, we look at game number two. Game number two. Game number two. Let me remind myself what happened in game number two. Okay. So, I was surprised that Hiberetic went a uh, Kalista route. Uh, very surprised. Um, it's like once again, I, I just don't see Timuretics as uh, the ball lane that is going to get value out of Kalista. You know, if you go even or behind with Kalista, in most matchups, is very losing. Uh, currently, Kalista Prio uh, did fall fall a bit lower, and uh, you know the strength of Kalista that you get to pair it with like uh, Renata. You pick it to one, two, three, and on blue side you have a strong combo to fight three v three bottom side. Like for example, in this game, if they went Camille here instead of Alistar, it would make a lot more sense because they can play, they can win bot, they can dive bot, they can play with Volibear Invade, Volibear Fight, and the enemy can't really pick a jungle uh, that is going to be able to match them properly. I just think here, Team Eretics kind of lost the plot on what, in my opinion, is their identity. Uh, Kalista, I don't think, fits what they want to achieve. I think... If they are playing Kalista, Volibear, I think you make sure that your support is something that wants to fight and really enjoy itself. And Oriana, same same way, doesn't really operate well in, 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 in that uh, type of a fast game. The BDS go back to the Karma. Uh, this time around, Jax is out, so they can't match the Volibear pick with the Jax on three. They go Olaf, uh, because this time around, Olaf is open, pairs well with Karma, and it's uh, Adam, you know. Adam Classic, his go-to blind. He only bans Gragas to set it up. We saw that Adam did play against Rumble and did play against Jace and anything else that you might throw at him, and uh, he did rather fine. And in this particular game, I don't think it's like some crazy good Olaf game because the enemy is showing Kalista, but uh, uh, Adam definitely, definitely uh, finds uh, a way. 
But I do think that Wunder uh, could uh, get uh, big advantages in this one. Because then that's the name of the game. Blue side needs to get advantages. That's why Alistar is so out of place. Like, how the fuck do you want to get an advantage that is significant with Alistar? Imagine you have Kanil, Kalista, Volibear. You cross into enemy jungle. You pressure the enemy jungle out. You take his camps. You put your balls down. And then you can even go so far to just dive bot because you fucking one shot with these champs, right? Uh, but uh, instead we have an Alistar. Kalista, Alistar and Volibear don't play on the same wavelength. And, uh, you know, that is all. Uh, let's uh, take a look at game number two. Wunder went Comet. We've seen some phase rush. I believe Photon went phase rush. Choice. Adam tried to look for a swing all in with his flashing goals, but he managed to base on Hexerinka. These are fine conditions to be in as Adam. Uh, it could be a lot worse for sure against Rambu. Rambu goes phase rush. I do think the blue side draft is, is stronger, but you need to get advantages, you know? I just think, still think this Alistair pick is just so wrong. Camille would have been perfect. Really, really perfect. I like the, the swap here from uh, Team Heretics, but I like as well that uh, PDS is very aware of it. The enemy team is swapping for the Void Grubs, and Rumble is going into bot to ult the wave. Rumble is much stronger weak side here because Olaf itemized magic resistance. We continue. So Malma Mortius. Uh, Olaf right now is in really good condition. Malma Mortius gets a lot of value. Good against Alistar. Uh, can fight against Oriana. Uh, can fight against Voli. Like Olaf is gone past that phase in the game where he is uh, weak. Uh, so uh, right now with the early game composition the team Heretics has played with the Voli, but they got away with nothing. They didn't get any advantage. Uh, didn't gain anything. Adam, Zaxing at the bush, spots Tromboner, and Tromboner, you know, just straight up loses Callisto. Uh, I think it's weird, it's weird to me how afraid uh, Team Heretics are to pull the trigger. I think that uh, Rumble here, after getting the wave, it seems like he wants to base for Leandris or something, not so sure. Um, it's just uh, the main thing that is awkward here is the fact that Callisto doesn't have item, Rumble doesn't have item. And uh, they are not finding an elegant way of actually connecting with uh, the Rumble. So in this spot, you kill the bot wave right, and then you use this bot wave to connect. You know, Olaf is now showing. You have an Oriana with a, with TP against the Kama. Like you should be able to cross into here and go fucking aggressively. But for some reason, Team Heretics want to enter into this bush. Team Heretics playing simple should just step into here. So Wunder is connected, clear this bush, and pull the Drake out. And that's it. But they are just masturbating here as, as, as three together and trying to trap Adam, which is a very desperate play. They already cleared the cannon wave, crashed it. I think they need to connect with Rumble, and that's it. But Rumble instead is catching wave defensively, and red side get the Drake, uh, even though that uh, they are weaker at this point in time. Little one for one. I don't know what the fuck happened to Adam here. He just kind of pressed S or something. I don't know what his other step was. He cancelled. Uh, he didn't get autos off. And maybe if Adam just. Legends properly. Uh, I'm so sorry for this yawn, guys. I, I have been awake for 12 hours straight now uh, commentating uh, League of Legends. We continue. I wonder if he's just stopping because he's waiting for Q cooldown so he can Q flash. Maybe that's the move. I'm not so sure. But nevertheless, he burns flash and goes, trades for Alice Summoners. So let's see which ones are significant. He picked Viego here on fire. It's hard to find the jungle pick that makes sense with Zinza being out and Jax being out with Kama mid. Uh, it's not so easy to find the champion, so he just went for something that plays fast, which is uh, perfectly fine and dandy for me. Olaf collapses. This is a Oriana that is catching bot, and for some reason, you know, Packet is doing this base where he gets spotted on the ward. And then he pushes forward, and Dabrov just ults him. And Dabrov knows, of course, that Packet has no flash. Once again, that the interaction with Nautilus, if he kills a wall, he gets E refunds, big part of the cooldown. Aram is going for Stridebreaker, of course. 450 HP, move speed bonus, all very, very good. Uh, of course, stats that uh, Olaf enjoys. 
Let's take a look at this fight. Back at no flash yet. Jimby just crumbles in and misses it. Complete with. You know, item wise, we see that Zeri has two core, which is uh, quite a big deal. Black has no flash. Some indications here the blue side is not ready to fight. So it goes very awkward if you're playing Kalista and Rumble and you feel like you're not ready to fight. You know, that's a, that's a problem and a flaw in itself. But nevertheless, take a look at the, a look at the rest of this. Trimby just doesn't uh, combo properly. Blackout goes over the wall. Adam flashes out, but just look at the amount of damage this Karma does. You know, I, I thought I thought really the Karma nerfs were, were big enough to, to push her out, but I guess if she can still do this, then nothing really has changed. Nothing has changed. Uh, I, I'm happy to admit when I'm wrong now. I think definitely Kama is still uh, strong because I had a discussion with someone in, in, in the YouTube comments. Shout out to that homie. I don't, I don't remember your name, but Mantra is as strong as ever. She hits uh, double Qs and uh, she gets Mantra again and she's just doing so much damage here. Zeri was uh, free DPSing too. It is a way for uh, Ice to actually use his flash better, but uh, the, the Q flash of Volibear and it is what it is. And ice flashes with the mess with the bull so he gets the horns all right so bds clearly in the winning spot as viral is showing on the bot wave so they're trying to force his tp by just hitting nasher enemy reacts uh, way too slow volibear has no flash so bds just look for the finish and nuke is posturing to poke i really like nuke uh, how he positions on objectives very good understanding like the synergy between Ice and Nuke, they never like infringe on each other's position, and I think uh, that's a very nice detail, you know, how, how Nuke uh, uh, plays uh, plays around the objectives to get the poke in as the enemy enters, you know. The enemy has to always pay a price uh, to get information against Nuke, which is a very important detail of having good objective control. Very important. And that's, uh, and that's it. That's it. We'll talk more about uh, BDS uh, versus, uh, of course, their coming match against Vitality a little bit later. First, we need to cover, of course, uh, the team heretics. I mean, Mad Lions versus G2 King. So, so, oh, I just need to stretch my shoulders, my back. Oh, take a little sip of water. They were, there were simpler times in the past. Ah, I'm covering every league. Maybe I need to <laughs> limit, limit it a bit more. But the playoffs all go, go, is happening at the same time. What, what can you do? All right. G2 ban Rumble. They ban Vi. They ban Nautilus. Okay. Uh, Senna still in the picture. I don't really have any commentary here on the bands. MDK ban Kalista, Nico, Azir, and Draven is open. Rel first pick. Very boring. Very simple. I thought when enemy shows Ari Jinx that um, G2 is just going to start simple. And um, do some Annie Draven action. Just make a fast paced game rock and roll. But they decide to look in Lushanami. Lushanami. Not that bad against Jinx, not that bad, uh, but um, yeah, you kind of expect more in this moment. Surprising to see Ari be the go-to blind. Um, Oriana still open in this picture. Oriana caps is something that is a classic. Uh, but G2 decided to go Lucian Nami and then drop to 5 with their mid lane pick. Here, Oriana Leblanc MDK bans. I think Leblanc is kind of a delusional ban. Who wants to play Leblanc with real jungle? You just invite Ari to buy Mercs and you have a miserable game. Uh, Jinx and Rakan, very scaling lane. It's a JTG classic, uh, but it's a hard lane to get away with. G2 decide to ban Twisted Fate. Uh, lining up for uh, most of the blind picks that people would do uh, on blue side. And then the Rek'Sai side, something that we've seen a lot now uh, in the LPL and also in the LCK. King and played a wonderful Rek'Sai side today. Uh, go check it out. Really smurfed against TF uh, specifically. Uh, but TF gets banned, it is something that MDK did well on, and Talia gets locked in. Here, a uh, very unique champion choice here, the Rengar. Uh, the Rengar, not an easy game to play Rengar against enemy tank jungle. You have a Talia rocks to, to deal with. Uh, Rengar, uh, despite uh, popular belief, 
uh, like Rengar is an insanely difficult champ. Like you have a lot of choices, micro decisions to make, and uh, your team needs to also understand which space is good for Rengar and, and which space is not. Don't underestimate how hard it is for Rengar. So it's quite a challenge to execute Rengar, even though the champion that uh, in many periods in, in 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 competitive league lifetime Rengar has been in a very OP state. Uh, Udrilo gets locked in, which is a very good lock in here, right? Decent lane against Rexai and just something tanky against the, you know, the poke damage of Lucian and of course Talia. So, MDK, they have a 2v2 mid that makes more sense. They have a matchup top that is quite balanced, but they have a matchup bot that um, is hard to play. Uh, later on, the key thing is, right, is that um, it's quite easy for Talia and Lucian to operate outside of the sphere of influence of NDK champions, so they need to find a way to really combo uh, Rakan, Ari, Rengar to find backline access in order to break the enemy. So we play the game. Uh, before I move on, I just wanted to highlight Ice was my MVP of the BDS series. Ice was my MVP. Uh, we take a look at this game. This is the wrong game. Let's click this one. Let's jump to the G2. G2 business. Drink some more water. Not sure what happened to Frescawi. Frescawi just ate a whole lot of rock. He just got a straight up dry solo kill here by Caps. As Elioia is approaching, Yike is uh, playing on his lane and then. Leoya just uh, tries to find the retaliation, but he doesn't want to trade flash. And uh, Leoya needs to back off, doesn't have any push, uh, doesn't have enough damage to flash auto him. And Caps gets a solo kill and he basically comes back. Very interesting here, Caps uh, doesn't buy boots, he just goes Tear and Dark Seal and Refillable. We all thought that he has boots and runes, but it turns out he doesn't. Very important W here from Caps and he finds the only moment to flash, it was very close. If Prescai wanted to secure this, he could have, of course, he flashed, but he did look quite dead, so I am not surprised or I don't feel too bad about this decision. The Jinx is suffering a little bit, but this has come to be expected. Uh, BB seems to be doing super well in the top lane matchup. Not so sure about this unending despair uh, build and so forth. So here in this moment, G2, uh, they are looking to pressure the Grom. But it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like Super is clearing most of the wave. Hansama is standing on the wave and hitting the next one. And Namirel isn't some kind of fucking combo. Uh, this is really troll. I think Yike is really griefing here. Um, G2 very discombobulated. Uh, this is a very, very bad look here for G2. Because here, Yike should, could get and should get very punished. He uh, W's out and G2 get away with murder. But somehow G2 decide to make the same mistake again and again. But the crucial thing, right, is that the enemy used Pryo to pressure Talia and then walk in the bot. And then G2 had a window to do something. They used that window to do nothing and even more so put themselves in danger. And now that Ari goes back to the midwave and pushes after what happened to um, Caps in terms of burning the enemy support and jungle time. Uh, Ari now walks into river and G2 somehow contests this cra crab. I don't know what the fuck Yak is thinking. Uh, this is of course very bad, it's like the idea is Jinx is showing on both wave, but uh, they know Ari position. Uh, Talia just came back to the wave, it's not level 6 yet, and uh, Yike is now face checking, but uh, Lucian is also very late to the play. He has no shoes and he just pushed the wave that Jinx is catching. So, once again, more danger. Talia doesn't reach 6 yet because of the gank. She tries to reach 6 on the wave, but by the time that happens, uh, G2 is just dead. They just die on, on two people, and uh, Frescawi is giga giga pet. These are things we don't want to see from G2. MDK, very strong early game team, but uh, uh, the things that happened on our, on our screen were quite dry. So some Whippo trading going on top. He's just uh, sending his full HP, and now Talia walls, and we see it on the minimap that he dies. And here Yike does a good job of, of, of trapping enemy bot. He just goes uh, through the bush in lane and, uh, and, and, and goes... Uh, was uh, full cover dots. He goes all the way around, doesn't get spotted. And, uh, he gets a nice gank in. Uh, Supa uses his flash terribly, if I remember correctly. You know, he gets flipped. It's a little bit too late. The guy got no flash. And uh, they get another kill. It was pretty big for G2. Big recovery. And 
fact, Frescawi doesn't get anything on the back end here. In fact, Frescawi has top. So, of course, Ari has a turn. In fact, the Frescawi doesn't get a kill here is, is, is massive, right? It's like yeah, all the damage gets blocked from the W and the R, and then the Q doesn't land on, on Sama that is fully awake. And right, we continue. Rengar has been gotten nerfed here in this department with the Brutalizer Serrated Dirk uh, by. But, um, so highlight that. You're not sure how you end up in this position. Um, Lucian and Nami don't have a flash. And now, uh, Darrell being topside, not so sure what Nami is doing, taking the plant, and crossing through. This is just a Mad Lion special. When they have a tempo swing, they cut through. They cut through into the enemy jungle. This is like uh, the, the red zone here for Mad Lions. If you don't have vision or control over this particular bush against Mad, they will always cut through and they will pressure into the bot, which is a very, very cool. I, I do think Mad Lions, even though they had a hard regular split, I think in terms of their understanding of early game dynamics, I think that they are actually low-key the best in the league at it. I think that their synergy with jungle support is uh, very good and uh, Mika gets heavily punished for it. Rel is on top side here and uh, G2 are just caught with their pants down. Uh, this at, uh, at an additional cost. Hansam of course is going to die too and uh, you know Mad Lions are in a pretty decent spot. Ari is super fed, Jinx is super strong and uh, Udir uh, you know as long as he's healthy top there's a very little counterplay that uh, Caps can look for when his team is uh, getting broken like that. Cap still no shoes, he just straight up uh, doesn't have boots and runes, doesn't buy boots. He's a bit of a psycho like that. Usually boots is the first buy on Talia for a lot of players to see their shoes. And um, Rengar has ultimate. MDK can easily walk into the bot turret, but we continue. Fast forward a little bit. Let's go ahead and look at some deeper elements, some deeper cuts. All right, so this was a very nice play. Mad Lions controlling full uh, river and using Fog of War. This is very awkward for Caps to play, very awkward for the bot lane to play because they can't contest in a neutral wave. Right, so that's another reference to MDK just being able to control bottom side river very well. At this point, Elioia is, is Giga strong, 800, 800 gold ahead, has Profane Hydra, Serrated Dark. He is uh, approaching critical mass quite high, and uh, Hans Sama will be very happy with the fact that he has, of course, an exhaust instead of. Maybe the one that is better for lane, which is of course the Ignite. Uh, of course, Talia uh, is already forced to go hourglass to defend herself. Uh, we continue. So here, Alvaro is operating outside the vision pocket, uh, finds the kill, but MDK just give away too much. They go, and then Mickey just here, the fact that uh, the flash from Super here, if, this is just quite ugly. And Caps can hover down, ult. Baro fucks up his W as well. Uh, right here, let me show you. Let's get the W on Yike. I don't know where the fuck he's Wing. He could have uh, taken it easy. And then Caps collects the last kill. So from a play that should have been wonderful. It's like Flash of Rakan was burned for this. Flash of Jinx was burned for this. Uh, they lose all of their advantage for very little reason. And this uh, bleeds into the Drake. And the G2 as well. I'm trying to find the exact moment where they got the mid turret. Because we are in a replay while it happens. I'm not so sure. So the turret is just low because of all that the Frescai roams into both. Okay, they just grab the turret dry. The mid turret is super important because as you transgress, trans, transgress uh, uh, into transgress, transpose. I uh, transpose into the mid game. You want Jinx to be in isolation on mid, catch the waves, and you want your Ari, Rengar, and Rak to take on full river. When you lose the mid turret, Talia already or, or, now has a way a wider angle to ult on you, and it's way easier for the Lucian to also pressure forward. So the wave uh, that Jinx needs to catch is no longer protected by the turret that she has behind her. She needs to catch a lot deeper. And when that happens, Jinx has a way harder time connecting to the fights. And of course, Ari and Rakan and Rengar uh, can't control the river just as easy. G2's composition in mid game wants to group as four. They want to, uh, you know, retake space together because of the weakness of Nami, while uh, the red side composition wants to play a lot more dynamic and capture the enemy solo laner that is farming on side. 
losing the mid turret is cause detrimental for both. Uh, but here extra so, especially when you're on red, because it gives you free entry uh, into uh, the Drake position. So here we have a situation. I think that it's very important for my lions to understand that they need to attack from the dig bush. And the, the big dig bush, of course, the G to take. They start the Drake is a very squishy one, so it goes fast. And with no mid turret, Jinx is now catching. And we can now fast forward to the fourth, the, the third Drake, sorry. Here we dies. Here we have. So AMDK, I think it's very important for them to just fight from the dick bush. You need to uh, make sure that you fight in areas where Rengar can actually use bushes to engage. And I think it's important to snap, engage, and, and look for the pressure from the dick bush position. Here, Frescao is going all the way around and they're hitting the crab. In my mind here, I think that from this position, you need to be able to be willing to, to send your spells. I, I think it, that MDK made it a little bit too easy for the enemy to, to cross through. I don't know where Rengar is going. Imagine Rengar is here, Ari is in this position of the, of the pit. They look to engage here with the snap. Uh, Rakan just needs someone to deliver him to the opposition. I think it would have been a little bit better. Because if Frisca is in this spot, he can play over the wall. And there's a lot more to be done. Because the moment G to take over this bush, Rengar loses a lot of value. And here again, here again, right? It's like. Uh, I think that in this moment, they should look to push her forward, maybe throw E of Rengar. Uh, they are waiting for Frescari to collapse, but I think it just becomes so hard for MDK to actually defend anything if they are in this position. I think that Rengar, very poor position. Um, it's very hard for them to actually find engages front to back when the enemy sees your composition completely. I think this is also one of those moments where Rek'Sai inherently has insane amount of value because of his tremor senses. Uh, if Rakan was over the wall, they would spot with Rakan. I mean, with with, with Rek'Sai, of course. Uh, this is also relevant to, to the champion strength. Here, Frisco is going for a very long, wide flank. He's trying to go, but very tough for MDK to actually break through when Italia rocks it down, right? These type of positions, G2 is very happy to be in because Rengar has no pushes. You get the Drake, but uh, at what cost? You know, like uh, he engages to the Woody and Rakan. Uh, Rex is just the boat, he's charging the face. After that, easy chilling. Just Hansama dashes towards Alva Alvaro, so he gets killed. Make uh, this push here a little bit closer than it should be. Uh, but G2 eventually win. Uh, just the crucial moments, right? Is, uh, you know, that bot lane 3v3 and losing mid turret out of all the situations. Caps was so busy this game. He killed top, he killed bot, he solo killed Caps for sure. Uh, MVP and uh, very sloppy from uh, the bot lane and the jungle to take space in such a poor way. Yeah, we continue. Uh, game number two. MDK, Van Draven on blue, Kalista, Argon Soul, G2, Rambo, Vi, Rel. This is the exact same draft we've seen from MDK in the past. Azir, and then Jinx, Oliver, Vivik, Ivan, Varus, and then Nautilus on three. Brown and Ataglas, can they follow up with the bands? Two champions that Alvaro likes to play. You know, he's a very classic player. He plays Rakan, Nautilus, Rom, Granata. Very solid pool. Uh, champions that can be useful in most games. And MDK prepare for the Varus uh, by banning Yasuo, Jax, and then sending Varus top blind. So, a Varus top functions similar to TF top. Uh, you get to, you got two aggressive summoners, and uh, the big difference is that you don't have a stun on your W. And, uh, of course, you don't have a passive that generates an uh, absurd amount of income. Uh, but uh, this is something that uh, they played in the past. MDK with the Baros, you know, it's hard for me to judge it. I think that a big weakness for Baros is uh, he doesn't have that uh, crazy itemization that he did in 2013, you know, I mean, 20, 23, 30. Time flies, huh? He can't itemize his way out of every situation. Uh, he can definitely find himself still in like really, really deep power holes that can really, really hurt him. So, Clara Khan gets locked in. 
I don't think it's a good Rakan game, but then again, it's just Alvaro likes the Rakan. Playing Rakan against Talia, Nautilus, Bolivar, even Jinx. And then TF on top of that is, is, is quite uncomfortable. But uh, Ivan gets locked in. I do think in isolation, Ivan is a great answer into Bolivar. It is funny though, MDK has played this exact draft in uh, Winter Split, I'm sure. These exact five champions, this exact draft order too. Uh, so it's funny to see that again. Uh, Ivan, I think, is uh, an underplayed champ. I think it's, it's a good lock in here against uh, the likes of Bolibaba. Okay, TF is locked in on five. You just uh, pivot then to play uh, playing the uh, poke battles. You can go cleanse and you can take it easy. But the issue here is you're playing against TF, Talia, and Bolibar. Uh, even not to these champions that can gank a ranged top laner easily, easily top. Jinx can blow up a wave while everybody is in fog. Not easy with Zyra Khan to push dive. And then through that, maybe they find a gank time on Varus, and all of a sudden his game just disappears, right? It's a way harder game for Varus to play than TF. The matchup matters a lot less than all the elements around them because both of these champions are insanely fragile. Uh, looking at this game, that was definitely the case. We had uh, a lot of action around top side. Let me fast forward to it. I didn't fast forward it too, too far. Yes, I did. So, between no cleanse, I do think that uh, G2, he yike, and Broken Blade kind of fuck up the gank. I don't know why they wait so long. At this point here, yike has Q, W, E. Yeah, Broken Blade still has Ghost on. You just wait for the fucking card to be ready, and then you rock and roll. Like, just fucking press your card and go. I don't know why they're waiting. They're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. They're waiting. And now Ghost runs out, and now they finally go while BB is stepping back. Like, you can just fucking walk on it and burn some sums and do some damage. I think also here, Yike, he should walk one more time. Here, he can tank on, on one more. And, uh, you know, maybe they can go so far to maybe even burn Flash here, but maybe that's too deep. Okay. Uh, another thing is, I think the E usage of Yike could be a little bit better. But uh, I think that's more related to just the gang member being bad because Ghost was out and they were so discoordinated. But nevertheless, Varus burns Ghost for uh, his own cleanse. Here, Nautilus is coming mid, Talia is on mid, Bolivar is very strong to fight, he has uh, Ruby Crystal, and Varus is not going to be on time to participate. Uh, Ilioia begins to beat up Yike because Azir is ready. I think here, plain and simple, I think that if you flash with Nautilus, you do full damage with Caps, full damage with Nautilus too. I think that you can one shot the Scowy. But Mickey Q's the wall. That's not desirable. If you flash Q over, hit, ignite, and then combo off of Talia, he's dead. But instead, we have the situation Nautilus has no Q, Yike use all spells and flash, and they have no reason and no way to actually catch up and now he gets a blue buff. Very big. And now TF is uh, stacking a wave on top and Bolivar is going to participate. It is Hugo saying that he can, uh, like on the Ivan Q, that Meruin can just uh, right click the Bolivar. I didn't know it worked like that, that you can right click out of the range, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure what, what Jizuke meant. Maybe someone can clarify in the YouTube comments. If you are in melee range and you, someone is Ivan queued, can you disengage to your out attack range? That doesn't sound like that's plausible. I don't know if he can like go deep to make uh, the make the E miss, but I don't I, 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 I don't really see how Jizuke saw that there was more to be done here. Maybe I should ask him. Uh, nevertheless, with this 2v2, now Miriam burns Flash. Leo is very low. He showcased it from before, right? Bolivar has tempo because he died. Uh, Caps collapses and rock and roll. Here, a small detail about Frescavi could have done different. If he knows the top lane situation is volatile and the enemy is stacking wave, he can just keep TP and walk to mid. He also has blue buff advantage here, so he can easily just stay as well and then TP top. I think that you walk mid here and don't TP. Uh, and then you TP top in case of a die situation. I think it would have been better. I think just staying mid to catch and then holding TP is probably the best move. So he had blue. He had blue. 
So now, Caps suddenly fed. Uh, Varus, no flash. It's going to have a very, very hard game. But uh, let's take a look at this play first. The Volibear is on top side. Elioia is spotting, looking for information. Spots the Gromp, trying to look if there's anything that signals towards uh, what Volibear is doing. But uh, they don't have any vision on him. Elioia just starts to face check with the stack away from bot. And considering Super 6 here, uh, looking for this dive is just a very good move. I think that instinctually Elioia believes when he sees the Gromp and that the enemy team has, uh, you know, camps open on both sides. He just simply believes, yo, Oliver is still top side or in base. Uh, something that changed, you know, an additional reason why blue side is a little bit better. Uh, diving from this angle is quite good because it allows you to spot if the jungle is actually defending. On the red side map, on, on blue side, right? If the enemy is defending, it's very hard to spot it. You just hug the wall. But if you go this route, you'll always spot the jungle before you dive. So, of course, Mad Lions pull the trigger. Once again, props to the early game. Here, trap placement is quite good from Han Sama. Makes Alvara not be able to go out. He gets um, CC'd and then out. Maybe you can let Super start the dive. But Super lines them up good with the flash. They get a double kill. Very big. Zaya now gets, of course, Kraken Slay on her base, and it looks like, ooh, maybe, maybe Zaya can carry. Not the easiest one to carry, right, because Talia Jinx and TF range is quite high, but uh, you have an Ivan and you have a Rakan to maybe deliver them to you, together with uh, Azir as an engage tool, and things can be good. Here, with item advantage, I did think that uh, maybe MDK can just fight a little bit harder. They don't have Daisy, maybe that's the reason why. I'm not so sure what G2 is actively looking for here. It could be also that they are just afraid of Talia because I think this ward might be spotted by Pink, but I'm not entirely sure. This one, it looks like it's not the same one up here. Um, but uh, maybe they think that Talia is going to ult here or something because Talia is crossing down to top side and Mirwin has no flash. So Caps finds the angle, they fake pressure on bot, and Mirwin uh, gets killed here. Naturally, so I told you before, uh, Varus has a very hard time staying alive. Uh, but G2's bot lane manages to catch a wave, and uh, they also try to get, get the Drake. So now... Wait, why is MDK so slow here? Talia, as Cav Cavs goes and they don't hit Drake, uh, I think it seems like they're just pushing the wave and they don't hit the Drake together. It seems like Galeria maybe started hitting it so late, but maybe without Daisy, it just doesn't do damage. Like the pet damage could have been uh, a lot more... a lot higher here. I don't like how MDK just masturbate in front of the turret. Uh, sure, they want to get that plating, but I think hovering for, him, for, for the jungle in mid is just way better. They can cross into mid after taking the Drake. Mickey, same thing. Mickey had a very horrible series. Root on Yike. He I guess, stopped on his flash. Yike and Mickey have like, quite a stinker of a series by their standards. You know, this has been a not the greatest split for them. Uh, we continue forward. So, Midwin, big trouble, big problem, you know, he's in pain. Look where Ivan is. What is Mad Lions the bot lane doing? Are they really feeling themselves here? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the craziness of Mad Lions, I guess, but look, look where Ivan is. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go look back and see if there's a way for Ivan to actually be on time to participate, but... I feel like um, Ivan has spent so much time not farming, so he should be allowed and be given time to actually farm and complete his, uh, his item. Because now uh, Bolivar is on Sun the Sky, they don't even win 3v3, so I think my Lions is bottling, it's just kind of uh, trolling here, but they can't get away with it. We fast board. And this situation was kind of crazy to me. Leo is now back on the bot side without uh, purchasing. Definitely has uh, uh, item in base. Good combo here. Very important detail is that Super doesn't have ultimate. He doesn't have ultimate. And, um, Yike just goes on him and then the Talia combo follows up. Ansama goes completely wide with his ultimate. 
Crucial ultimate, especially when you're limping into the fight and you're late. Uh, Broken Blade just doesn't have ult just yet. Caps with a good flash. And uh, Caps is now going to follow up with uh, the wall. Very insane that the situation is so damn close. It's like you try to, you know, Caps uh, just places a very terrible W. I think maybe you could just kill uh, Alvaro here uh, off of the Mickey CC, but there we have it. It was quite strange to me that uh, G2 is the team that end up uh, getting the Drake. They just um, take full space bot side and then they cross into top side to defend their own jungle camps and to defend the Varus and take Rift. Here in my mind I thought that it was just going to set up for the Drake, take it the time. Maybe the reasoning is that uh, Supa, they don't have sums, they're almost at 2 core, maybe they don't want to the situation where the enemy gets Herald and dive top and take top camp, so they just decide to give Drake after Azir push bot all the way. Not so sure. I, 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 in my mind, I thought that they look uh, pretty fit and ready to ready to fight. Because look, Ivan also has item. It was like an easy choose to stay on the bottom side, but with no information on top, maybe Varus is just too scared to play the game and they're worried that uh, TF is going to become. Uh, completely unbearable if the game continues, but it is a Hextech Drake and uh, it, it, it of course uh, gives a lot of value and relief uh, to the Jinx position of the game. We continue. Uh, once again, MDK special. Look how deep Rakan already is, putting vision. He gets spotted from the vision plant by Jinx. Uh, Yike has full information here. Uh, I think Yike is just... Um, just... Uh, trolling. I'm not sure what the thought process is here. I don't know what the thinking is. Really can't... Uh, can't justify this, you know? Seems like everyone on G2 is aware. There's nothing to contest there, you know? Uh, you can wait, maybe pull out uh, the red with your E and just pull it towards the bush just to win time and then play with the tempo of your teammates. Zion now on 2 core, you know, blue side is very incentivized to accelerate the game because this Jinx is very, very weak here. I think Horizon Focus would be the better buy for Caps. He went for a very early Cripplum, which uh, I'm not super big fan of in this game. So now Zaya, Prime, Primed up to carry. Not sure what Caps is doing here on the neutral wave. Very uncharacteristic mistake of Caps because Caps should hover mid. Right now, blue side team is the one bleeding, and I think he should hover mid to just match. He should wave, put wave to cross into him. Here he can look to pull mid, maybe burn some sums instead of being in this position. He feels safe to push deeper, but Friskawi just undermines him. He has mercs and he has more expensive item, so of course, Friskawi wins the 1v1. Caps cancels the wall and uh, he dies. MDK starts hitting Nashor. They have enough bursts, of course, with everybody involved. They wait for the TFO to run out. Supa is not hitting because he doesn't want to do too much damage. Maybe, you know, you do a Jinx Rocket combo smite here for Yag. Maybe it would be the best uh, course of action. But the enemy team does better on the burst and uh, Yag dies. This is a Drake for it and G2 is now on soul point. In terms of the game state, you see that uh, Zaya is in very good condition. They have Nash, MDK should really win this game. Everything is indicated that she won this game, but we just have this absurd sequence coming up here where media MDK just completely throw. All they need to do now is just base, base, reopen on mid, play top, push top all the way. The wave is very close to your side, so it's already slow pushing towards the enemy. Pretty good. But instead we have this absurdity. So let's say Grumpy, he's on vision. And now Talia walls. And then the pink ward is placed at the the pink ward is targeted by Supa. Supa gets killed and midwin loses summoners, which is just as bad as dying. Actually, he did die in the end of Jijing, so I forgot. We continue. Here, I have no clue what Mickey is doing. Mickey is just being a psychopath. He just wants to go for the card, but Celestial. 
celestial passive thing, I don't remember what it's called. Celestial opposition. It's just tanking everything and Mickey dies. I'm so sure. Uh, what they are putting. They just created so much volatility for no reason but they can just base and spend their gold. And it goes for Skawi and uh, G2 players really get away with murder because the move speed from this plant really saves them and then this plant getting them all the wall also uh, really saved them. Here in this extended fight, Frescari just flashes on the spot. Maybe there's something more that he could be done could be done here with the Shuriba Shuffle. So let's try to crash the wave on top. And then here Frescari just uh, flashes back to the same spot. Maybe there's a way for him to go for the aggressive one because he does have Mercs here. So he's a little bit more durable than maybe expected. And Navarro, of course, has Charm too to buy him time. And maybe he can do the aggressive play and uh, you know make a play that uh, is remembered forever. Or for the Mad Lions fans. All right. The TF now committing to the tier two. They're giving uh, the Drake up, plain and simple, for a tier two on top side. This is fine. This is the option you get when you are the team on Salt Point. Uh, Kim Tech Dragon gives nothing for them. Uh, this is the eco situation that I mentioned. You know, we talked about Adam. Uh, burning ult too soon. This is the opposite, you know. It's like BB is pushing top until someone shows top and then he ults and breaks the play because his team is going to be tethered to the situation. Evaros was the mid wave and now TF is just porting and they find Bidwin who uses both flash and goes uh, Glensoy, which leads to Nash. And that is all she wrote. That is all she wrote. Now let's talk predictions, ladies and gentlemen. MVP for me is Caps, plain and simple. Caps was the most important player by far. MVP of the split for me uh, as a whole, because currently Jesus' bot lane and uh, Jungle are underperforming in my mind. I think Han Sama is doing fine. I think Han Sama is playing solid. I think it's more like Mickey and, and Yike just uh, not playing to, to the level at all. And I think that in terms of where the meta is for BB, he looks very comfortable. Uh, Fnatic versus G2. I, I think Fnatic, uh, they didn't look like insane in their series against GX, but they are playing against GX. They can pretty much get away with, with anything there. Um, I um, do think that uh, BB is playing better than Oscarine currently. I do think that um, you know the main point of danger is if... Like, Humanoid is the only mid laner that is good enough, I think, to actually contest caps in lane. And... I do think that Razorg is sharper than Yikes, so I think if there's conditions where Fnatic are playing mid jungle 2v2 and they can break caps so he doesn't get to solve these situations where G2 have put themselves in a pinch in a very unnatural manner. I say unnatural because he's forced to do, he, he like caps is forced to overperform uh, for the game to even make sense. And uh, that's the angle in for Fnatic, right? I think that's the angle in. I think. As the game progresses, I do think that Fnatic are a lot less sharp than G2. So Fnatic definitely need to build advantages early on to attack uh, G2's uh, current weakness, which is the imprecisions of Yike in the early and the imprecisions of also Mickey in the early game. Uh, in terms of the drafting from what we saw, like G2 dropped the Lucian Nami, which is something that Fnatic also dropped with the Lucian Nami 4-5. Um, I think that in terms of the champion pool of Oscarini, uh, I am kind of curious to see, you know, if the Kisande ban will, will stick. I think that, um, you know, in terms of attacking the pool of um, Mr. Humanoid, if G2 want to attack Azi removal and Oriana removal and make the game a lot more dynamic, uh, that's something that can happen but at the same time you know throughout the split i think that humanoid has shown a very positive side to himself in the fact he has played karma he's played ari and he's played talia too so i think that banning mages isn't some great angle that you can leverage against humanoid so uh, i think that in terms of draft the main thing that i'm curious about is just bot lane mdk took the approach of picking rakan which is the scaling approach but I think that um, June and Mickey want to play very similar champions. You know, Lucian Army, some Blitzcrank action, some Nautilus action. Uh, so hopefully there will be fireworks around bottom side. 
And uh, the question is, what kind of a form will, will Yike bring to the table? I do have to say, I still think that G2 are favorites, but there's definitely angles for Fnatic to explore and to expose. But I, I can't really think of what is the best way to approach it when it comes to the draft details. I do think taking Yike off the usual easy junglers to play, like the Rel, could be an approach. Uh, Rel definitely will be a contested champion, and, and, and maybe there is, uh, you know, the reason I say removing Rel is because you get away with making so many mistakes on Rel. It's a very easy champion to play. I think if Rel is out, if Monka is out, maybe uh, you can go so far to make sure that the 2v2 mid lane is very dynamic and explosive with the likes of Lee Sin, Vi, Xin Zhao, Volibear even. And I think that this is where Razor should be better. So maybe there's room for Fnatic to explore to attack that jungle pool. Um, another thing that has worked well against the G2, but they should be aware by, by now, is that uh, a Nico ban and... Um, uh, the Callista removal, you know, is arguable, but uh, it seems like G2 were not interested in playing uh, Draven today, especially here when it was open. So there's a big Lucian army against Jinx. For Fnatic, you know, the things that I do worry about is Oscar Inim. You know, his performance has been up and down. I think that Noah, as the game progresses, doesn't play good enough. I think that, um, honestly, I feel like Ice is everything that people think Noah is. That's it. I think I think Noah is um, not super impressed. Like he has good conditions in the game, and if you press Sab, he looks he looks so much scarier than than he is in the game. He just uses summoners poorly, fights poorly, and it's just a very easy AD to kill. And uh, this is something that Noah needs to work on. You know, definitely needs to work on. The other series, Vitality versus BDS. Vitality had. Um, a very poor showing, in my opinion, uh, against SK. Um, they were lucky that SK played as poorly as they did, because those had uh, one of the worst individual performances we've ever seen in a best of three. He played terrible. He played quite ass. And um, Vitality, in terms of the flaws they saw, I think that Hilly was a little bit too loose. I think that that's something that you don't get away with uh, against uh, BDS in their current form. I think that um, Douglas, Shio, I think that um, both of them have showed some inconsistencies. But in terms of mid lane, I do have to give at the edge to, to Nuclear End. I think that he is just um, a tougher nut to crack, tougher mid laner to gank, tougher mid laner to break. And I think that he plays positions very well. I think Vitality, in terms of their setups, is quite too sporadic for my liking. I think that often they... It's like it's like throwing paint at a canvas and then trying to explain what it is. And I think Vitality, Healy, Kazi, you know, Photon, they are very good players at explaining what that paint is. But I'd rather have someone, you know, just, um, you know, paint with intent. The analogy is basically, I don't think Vitality has some kind of resemblance of setup because a lot of their situations need to be solved through individual skill. And I think the balance between being in situations where you solve things because of individual skill, that's nice and all, but you also find yourself in a lot of shitty situations where you just kind of look bad. I think Vitality throw too often, their setups are way too in in inconsistent, and I think BDS has the edge here. I think that BDS is more likely to beat Vitality than G2 uh, beating Fnatic, even though I think G2 is the favorite. G2 to me has shown some flaws that I think Fnatic can expose, but Fnatic at the end game is tough. Those are my predictions. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys uh, will enjoy uh, the matches as much as I would. Uh, please uh, leave a comment with question if you want. I, I, I will answer.